Okay, so we just finished Enterobacter ACA. Things that you need to know. Well, all of these things are oxidase negative. And almost all of them are nitrate positive, which means that they reduce from nitrate to nitrite. Um, but every single one of them ferments glucose. That's a big thing that you have to understand. Now, you're probably thinking, well, didn't we have some that had a red butt? Mm, I don't think so, but, you know, they're one of the things that is commonly addressed is that they all ferment glucose. All right. So, we put these in little groups, okay? The first group is, are the E. coli, um, Enterobacter, and Klebs. So those are coliforms, and they're all lactose fermenters. They all have an A over A reaction on the TSIs. Some of them produce gas, some of them don't. Most of them do. Proteus, Morganella, and Providencia are all non-lactose fermenters, and they always have a K over A reaction on the TSI. So, as you know, some of the Proteus make are H2S positive, some of these things are not. So, Morganellas and Providencias may or may not have the black. Salmonella and Citrobacter both are, have the black. They are, um, they have no set, um, TSI reaction because as you saw, citrobacters will be um, lactose fermenters sometimes, non-lactose fermenters sometimes. So that K over A with the black, that's more of a salmonella, not so much a citrobacter. So citrobacter sometimes can be A over A. I know that's strange and weird, but We've lumped them with salmonella because they are con commonly mistaken for salmonella when you're looking at your McConkie plates. Okay. Usually they have a late fermentation. Um, Shigella, uh, Serratia, and Yersinia. Shigella are lazy. They, they're always K over A. Um, Serratia could be K or A over A, and Yersinia are A over A. These are considered the weird ones. So they all have their own little idiosyncrasies that go with them. Okay. So E. coli, most of us have seen what they look like. They're very um, large and mucoid looking. Some, some of them and most of them are beta hemolytic. Um, McConkie, they're dry, rough, purpley, pink, uh, have a lot of bile precipitation in the auger around them. On EMB, they have that nice, pretty green metallic sheen to them. Um, that's on top of that deep, purpley black colony. And then um, HEA, um, they don't grow as well on there, but they grow as that nice orange lactose fermenting organism. And this is what they're supposed to look like. This is not very good. It should be more orangey. Okay. But there's your beta hemolysis. There's your McConkie. There's your EMB. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I already told you guys what you need to know about the biochemicals. Okay. What you also need to know is that E. coli is the number one causative agent of urinary tract infections. Okay, that is the most commonly isolated pathogen. Okay, um, in stool specimens, the the major one that we're looking for is this enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which is that E. coli 0157H7. Because that one actually produces a shiga toxin and is very easy to kill you. So we want to make sure that we find that one. Um, and then for opportunistic infections, you can, of course, 
become septic with it or have meningitis. Um, it is one of the causative agents of meningitis in babies. Okay. I did tell you that you need to know what your KO and H antigens are, what they're associated with, that the O is with the LPS layer, the K is the capsule, the H, or the O is somatic. Okay, so it's part of the cell. Um, and H is the flagellin, the protein that makes up the flagella. So it'll be in modal organisms. Okay. <clears throat> when we're looking for E. coli 0157H7, you need to be using McConkie with sorbitol in it. Okay. Um, what happens is it'll grow as a lactose fermenter on McConkie, but then when you use the McConkie with sorbitol, it won't grow as a pink one. Um, and then you know that it's negative for the sorbitol fermentation, and then that's how you it's pink here, but not pink here, and you can say that that is um, E. coli 0157H7. Klebnumo, okay. sorry, we know that it's nice and ooey gooey and disgusting and um, mucoid looking, and what happens is when we go and we touch it and try to get some specimen, it strings out. Um, Club pneumo is almost always encapsulated and it can and will produce a metallic sheen on EMB as well as E. coli. Sometimes it might not be as pretty, but it does produce it because it is a fast fermenter. I told you about knowing to need, needing to know the biochemicals, um, biochemical reagents. Club pneumo, um, of course causes pneumonia that is one of the things that it causes um, so where we can find this we'll find it mostly as a causative agent as pneumonia but we can also find it as peritonitis so in the peritoneal fluid or septicemia um, urinary tract infections sometimes um, enteritis in children occasionally but you know, mostly this is one of those things that's a good guy, and as long as he's not in the wrong place at the wrong time, then he's not causing a whole lot of problems. Okay. Your enterobacters, pretty similar to Klebs. You know, you need to know your biochems. Um, these are a little bit different because they don't, they're not as mucoid. They have pretty large um, colonies, but they're not as gooey looking on their colony morphology. Okay. So, on to group two. Okay, Proteus. Now we have a swarmer here. Proteus mirabilis is known for swarming. Okay, um, It swarms on blood, it doesn't swarm on McConkie or any of the other stuff. So, EMB, McConkie, no. You will have non-lactose fermenters on EMB and McConkie, and you will have the swarming on the blood. Mostly this guy, not so much this. Proteus vulgaris does not swarm as readily as Mirabilis, okay? So if you see this swarming on here, immediately say Proteus Mirabilis. Um, <coughs> biochemicals, you need to know these things. The difference between these are, is in the ornithine and the indole. Um, vulgaris is positive for indole and negative for ornithine and it's flip-flop for mirabilis. That's a very important thing to know. As you'll notice these things are um, highlighted and starred in color. There's a reason for that. Right. <coughs> um, Proteus, again, UTIs, anywhere it's not supposed to be. Uh, sometimes we can get them as eye and ear infections, not commonly though. Okay, Morganelle morganii, we don't get this very often. Um, it can look a little like a protease because it's non-lactose non fermenting, um, but then it's H2S negative. Okay, so again, 
you know, unless it's, in, if it's somewhere where it's not supposed to be, it can cause a problem. Providencia, again, is a non-lactose fermenter. It doesn't grow really well. Um, so if you want to grow it really, really well, put it on XLD. Um, uh, that's weird because not everybody uses XLD, but it's one of those interesting things. Um, it's typically considered non-pathogenic, except for it can cause UTIs. If you have some, if it gets into a place where it's not supposed to be again, then we would consider it a pathogen. Salmonella and Citrobacter. Now, Citrobacter, I told you earlier, can be lactose fermenting or non lactose fermenting. Correct? So, depending on what we see, um, depends on what we're going to put down for our TSI reactions. Salmonellas are always non lactose fermenters and almost always urease negative, whereas Citrobacter is urease positive. And both of these are H2S positive. So if you see non-lactose fermenter that's H2S positive, first thing you think is salmonella. Then you do a urease and you figure out, try and figure out, is it or isn't it salmonella? Okay. So you typically see the the little black centers on these. This is the bismuth sulfite auger, so they actually, the whole colony turns black. On all the other augers, it's usually a black center. You can't see it very well on here, but there's a little ring around that black. Um, and I think you guys saw that on the HE, where it was green and then had dot of black in the middle. Or at least, I hope you saw that. So... Um, again, know your biochemicals. Things that you need to understand about salmonella is that salmonella is absolutely always considered a pathogen. It is not normal flora for us. Um, it can cause some really bad infections, um, whether it be wound infection, diarrhea, salmonellosis of any sort, um, can go to septicemia pretty quickly. Okay. Um, so, you have gast gastroenteritis is caused predominantly by the one that we play with in lab, Salmonella typhimurium. Um, septicemia is very, we get cholera suis, I can never say that right. Um, enteric fevers, so Salmonella typhi, paratyphi can cause those. There is such thing as typhoid fever. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, you know, typhoid Mary, Salmonella. Okay, Salmonella likes those lovely little salty locations, gallbladders. Britta has no problem with her. Um, she doesn't have any Salmonella living there anymore. If she did have it, um, but you can get Salmonella, and it can stay with you and hitch a ride in your gallbladder and stay there for a really, really long time. So, salmonella and typhi can cause that typhoid fever, and then you can recover and become a carrier forever and ever, keep it in your gallbladder, and that's not really great. Let's see. Um, the gastroenteritis caused by typhimurium is usually associated with poultry or egg products. And you have really, really bad diarrhea. Um, the mucosal lining gets very swollen, won't allow absorption of things through. And so we have a lot of water and electrolyte loss. Not to be confused with this, of course, is Citrobacter fundii. Um, it looks very similar many times on the media. Looks a lot like Salmonella, but it is not. Okay, so 
big thing that you're eating.